Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I had a topic ready for today, uh, but given everything that's going on inside the building and a little bit outside the building, I thought we'd jump right to questions to try and get them answered for you. So with that, I'll open up to questions. What did you make of the Senate's vote yesterday on Secretary Saunders? Um, it was disappointing, obviously, uh, but not unexpected. Uh, given what we've seen over the last uh, couple of weeks. And, um, but again, you know, we'll move forward from there. Why move forward? Why appoint her interim right out in minutes, moments after lawmakers shot down her confirmation? Well, I have the constitutional obligation to fill a vacancy. And so I decided to move forward, anticipating what might happen. Uh, to give the agency itself, the Agency of Education, some stability uh, that they desperately need. And um, I knew that uh, Zoe was well prepared. She'd been on the job for two or three weeks and was ready and, and already made uh, some, some ground, uh, I think, and, and could hit the ground running. So it was more for the stability. And uh, again, my complete faith in her I still believe she's the right person at the right time for this position. So I thought we'd just fill that interim position with the Secretary of Education that we started with. Constitutional law experts I spoke with say that because you appointed an interim cabinet member during the session, that could give the legislature legal standing to take your administration to court if, if they so choose. Is, is that a concern of yours? It's not a concern of mine. Um, it may be a theory. It may be something that the courts may have to decide. I'm not a constitutional uh, authority, but, um, but I think we're on solid ground. Do you think that um, this is sort of a one-off situation where the Senate rejected one of your uh, conferees, your nominees, uh, and you went ahead and appointed the person anyway? Or is this going to be something that's in the back of your mind as you make other appointments that if the Senate doesn't like it, you're going to go ahead with it anyway? Well, again, this was to fill an interim position. Uh, it wasn't to fill the permanent position. So we are moving forward with that. Again, I have an obligation to make sure that the executive branch is functioning, and I need to fill that spot. We have a lot of work to do in that area, a lot of things going on right here in this building. Uh, today uh, with education and and all the property tax increases and and so we need someone uh, to be at the helm right now so that's why I made the decision I did it, it does it affect your view of the confirmation process and uh, if, if you face a situation like this again uh, you're just gonna stick to your guns well it's just an interesting process I don't think there's any other process quite like it. Uh, we have, uh, there was 19 uh, applicants to the State Board of Education. They had to narrow that down to three. They went through 19 applications, narrowed them to three, that, who they thought were the best, most capable to send to me out of the 19. And uh, we picked one of them. And that wasn't good enough. So. I think Senator Cummings said it best uh, when she gave her remarks uh, in terms of uh, toxic atmosphere and the partisanship. And uh, we thought we were some sort of special snowflake here in Vermont where things like that didn't happen. They happen in other states, uh, particularly red states, uh, but it happened right here in Vermont in a blue state. With her appointed as interim secretary, does that mean you're going to direct the Board of Education to reopen the application process for a permanent? We'll secretary? contemplate that over the next week or so. I haven't uh, decided what we're doing from here. Uh, first things first, uh, making sure that we have somebody at the helm of the agency and uh, provide stability to the agency itself. As you know, she's received blowback, blowback from some lawmakers and from some in the education community, the people that she'll have to be working with on the ground. What's your read on, on whether she'll be able to do her job and if so, like how effectively she'll be able to, to do her job? I have said right from the very beginning, the more you get to know her, uh, the better you uh, understand uh, how capable she is and how necessary it is to have somebody with her energy and her skill set 
at the helm. And um, so I'm quite confident once they put down the partisanship and put the move that aside and really look at her attributes that they will agree uh, that she will do great things here in the agency. Just give her a chance. Because you've talked a lot about the difficult decisions facing the next secretary, facing the legislature in terms of education, school consolidation, closing small schools. Um, are you concerned that she enters this process with so many people not trusting her? Well, again, I, I think what I heard on the uh, floor of the Senate yesterday, uh, there was there was um, debate uh, on what their their issue was with her. Um, but I think for the most part, all thought she was very bright um, and uh, was uh, affable and someone that I think they could work with uh, if they could just uh, put aside the, the par uh, partisanship and the politics. So I have, uh, again, full faith in her. Um, I would question in the future, after seeing this debacle over the last couple of weeks, anyone else who wants to put their name forward, I think, I bet there wouldn't be 19 um, out applying for this position after seeing the way she was treated. But she did so with grace, she moved through it held her head high, and um, again, it, it just confirmed that um, I made the right choice. Would you rule out reappointing her for the position in a permanent capacity? Um, I'm not ruling anything out at this point, uh, but, um, but we'll contemplate that over the next few weeks. And with that in mind, how do you understand you know, the constitutional language that gives the Senate uh, the ability to or the duty to advise and consent your appointments. If, if you can reappoint someone, you know, how do you square that with their constitution? Well, I think you can bring uh, that. Uh, I think that's been done before. I think it was done during the Dean administration uh, where he brought uh, another, we brought the same people forward uh, and they didn't confirm. So it's been done before. Um, I'm not saying that's what we're going to do. Well, that's down the road, but um, but I think that there uh, is precedent in that area. And does that precedent sort of align with your moral understanding of the decision? Does that lead you to believe it is proper to reappoint someone after they've been rejected by the Senate? Well, I think um, if it's proper, yeah. I, I think, again, I think this was a a partisan political hit job. Um, so I would say that once they get through that and they get their pound of flesh, which they did, uh, it was all uh, against me, uh, that uh, maybe they will come to their senses and see what I s see and, uh, and confirm her next time, if, that, if that's the path we choose. Do you know the literary origins of a pound of flesh? I do not. Do you? Yeah, it's uh, Shakespeare being quite anti-Semitic, I believe. Oh, well, I didn't mean to be anti-Semitic. Um, shame on me for not understanding some of those areas and those sayings. But that wasn't what it was meant to be. Governor, you just opened up, of course, to questions. Skip to the opening topic here. Um, you mentioned that in Really, this whole session, you've said it just feels different in the building. You said, given everything that's happening in the building, you know, I want to follow up with Sarah's question from a few, three weeks ago. I mean, are you still meeting with the pro tem and, and the speaker? I mean, what does that communication look like? And what's your assessment of the relationship right now? We, we are. Uh, I met with the speaker last week. Uh, the pro tem um, was busy on Friday. I think they were in session, so he'd asked that we postpone that. Uh, but we're s still on speaking terms. Uh, I think, again, I put the the politics aside, and uh, I can work with them. And I hope they can. Uh, they believe they can work with me. How do you square your characterization of this process as toxic and highly politicized with the characterizations of many senators? Had of it as merely an effort 
to assess her, her, her credentials, her experience, her, and whether she would be a good fit for this job in this state at this time. Those are two very different characterizations of sure. the process. Um, if nothing else, I don't know as they did their total homework. I listened to the debate again on the Senate floor, and I heard one senator claim that, um, that Zoe did not have more than three months' experience in the public education sector, which is not just not true. So they didn't have all the facts, uh, they didn't have all the information, obviously, or they didn't. Uh, they chose not to, or they chose to ignore it. One of the one of the two. So I um, again, I believe with her skill set, it's ex she's exactly what we need here at this point in time. Because we have a lot of, again, structural changes that need to be made. Property taxes are going through the roof. And, uh, and we, need to, uh, we, need, we need change now. Something I've been talking about for the last eight years. But finally, they're coming to grips with the situation we find ourselves in. And some of the same issues that I brought up over the last eight years uh, they're saying that we now need to study. So I'm, um, I'm looking forward uh, to working on those issues. Do you, do you blame the Senate for the toxicity of the approval process, of the confirmation process here, or do you blame the outside groups that, by all accounts, were whipping up opposition to her? With I think there's a lot of outside groups uh, that were involved in this. I have a great deal of respect for many of the senators, many of the senators who voted no, uh, I've worked with in the past. And um, it's unfortunate that it got to this point. But this isn't just in Vermont. Uh, this is across the country. It just seems to be more anger in throughout the country. And um, again, um, I thought we were, as did Senator Cummings, uh, that we were somehow immune to that. but. Uh, that didn't prove to be the case. Governor, what do you make of the potential of Howard Dean possibly making a run for governor again? I, I had heard that. Um, uh, interesting. I, I, don't, I don't know if that's true or not. I haven't heard from him. Um, the only thing I will tell you is, uh, and you can take this one to the bank, uh, 24 years from now, I will not be on the ballot. <laughs> <laughs> I will make that known, as I've said, after the legislative session. The Senate shown a lot less appetite for some of the tax proposals um, presented in the House this year. The, the yield bill now sits in Senate finance. Do you expect, what do you expect from them? Do you think that they're more willing uh, partners in this challenge than the House? Um, I'm hopeful that the entire legislature is more open to suggestions. We, um, we sent them a letter, the conferees, this morning, uh, asking this is in the appropriations, because I feel the two are tied together. Uh, I think we need the appropriations uh, bill, the big bill, uh, is going to have to take some action to reduce some of the property tax rates uh, and, uh, and possibly backfill to bring down some of those rates as we have seek uh, structural reform. So those two are, are linked. And um, so we sent some suggestions this morning as to how we could accomplish that. And um, I'm hoping that they will listen to that and, and work with us on, on that issue. Because Vermonters are, are hurting. Um, they don't know how they're going to pay those property taxes. And uh, at this point, uh, they're not seeing much relief, and and I believe there's a path to giving them that relief. Kind of sticking with the Senate and budget, uh, with the budget that came out of the Senate with the hotel and hotel programs, that's a hard cap and adverse weather and on weather, 1,000, 1,300. Have you reviewed that and kind of just what are your thoughts on implementing these hard caps for the hotel and hotel program? Well, again, um, I think those, um, the hard caps are, in some respects, um, sound like they would be helpful, but I'm not sure that they are. We want to make sure that we're helping those who really need the help. Uh, putting the hard caps in doesn't always accomplish that. 
uh, because when you have an adverse condition, if you already have people in there and there are various uh, 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 people in the program uh, that may or may not need as much help as somebody else, um, unable to, to get assistance, get the assistance they need. So we, um, I believe, we're working with them to, to work through that uh, language. And uh, it's one of those areas where it's, uh, you know, things are volatile, very, uh, they're moving quickly. Um, and so we'll see what happens in the end. I don't know if we want to ask it. I don't know who's on today from. Or, uh, um, Todd is on. Yeah. Todd, is there anything I, uh, I missed in that that uh, you want to weigh in on? Uh, no, Governor, I think it, it continues to be a, a, an area of engagement by the legislature, and we continue to um, plan for what we see as the future of the general assistance housing program. Um, you know, but we watch with anticipation where the final language ends up in the big bill, and I know that the conference committee is working on it right now. Hypothetically, if these caps went through, is that something you'd be supportive of or not supportive of from an overall perspective? We will, um, we will do our part uh, to make it work, whatever they come up with. Um, we continue to work with them uh, to give us uh, the, the best approach and from our perspective. Um, but um, but whatever they end up with, we'll, we'll put into place. And then going back to yesterday, too, um, what did you make of the Lieutenant Governor in the government's letter that you put out over the weekend and apologizing after the vote as well yesterday? Um, I was, um, I thank him for, uh, for admitting uh, to his error over the weekend and the apology he gave. Um, I might have suggested that he give that at the beginning of the deliberation rather than at the end after the vote. But, um, but I want to acknowledge that um, at least he, he stepped up and, uh, and made amends in that regard. You've mentioned a couple of times sort of the realization that there's a toxicity of politics that you thought Vermont might have been immune from, but it's clear that it's here now. Does that make it more or less likely that you'd want to serve another two years? Um, in some respects, uh, some of what we've experienced over the last couple of weeks uh, would lead me to jump back in um, because I think that we can do better. Oh, I think there was a number of them, um, whether it's the NEA, uh, the superintendents, um, many, many groups. The NEA represents teachers who work in the schools. How is that an outside group? Those are the people who well, they aren't part of the legislature, are they? Maybe they are. I haven't looked lately. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. That's still an outside group, as I see it, outside the legislature. Do you think that the NEA should have a role in these debates? Well, obviously, they, they took that role, and they continue to take that role. Other outside groups do as well on many, many other subjects that we're dealing with right now. They're still a lobbyist group in some respects. Um, so, you know, that's the way this process works. But they're, they're a lobbyist organization. I just wanted to follow up. You, you said given all that's happened in this building in the last few weeks, your instinct is to jump in because we can do better. Why do you feel that way? Well, I don't want to give up, you know, give up on Vermont. I believe we can be better. Um, and sometimes, you know, the stars align in different ways, um, and they are not aligning in the in in the ways that um, we should be proud of here in Vermont, uh, but across the country either. So I think it takes leadership uh, to rise above that, and uh, and I think that uh, again I think I've proven uh, over the last eight years that I'm willing to rise above a lot of things and uh, and trying to bring people together. So if I can 
provide that leadership effectively, then that may be part of my decision. I want to get back to school budgets for a second. Uh, yesterday, I think it was seven failed and four passed. What's your read on, on like, are these budgets, do you think they're more uh, palatable for, for voters now, or is it a turnout issue? I mean, what, what do you, what's your sense of where, well, I, th where I think it's, all, it's probably all of the above. I mean, in the first round, um, in, in fact, in, in many towns and um, supervisor unions, they were mail-in ballots. They, they received those by mail. So I think more people voted. Um, some don't even know when, they're, when they're, the voting date to re-vote is, um, speaking to many over the last few days. Um, so I think, uh, again, I, I think mail-in ballots is part of the answer. I've been advocating for that for quite some time in all different types of elections. And I think in this case, I think we should have mailed out a second, second round or third round uh, to make sure that we're capturing the will of the voters. So you're saying you'd like to see in an ideal world every district do mail out ballots every, every time? I do. How do we pay for that? Well, we, we would find ways to pay for that, uh, obviously, just like anything else in government. Uh, there's, where there's a will, there's a way, but I think um, I think voting is important, uh, obviously. Uh, I think uh, more participation is better, and, uh, and we have to find ways to, to bring people in. Because when you look back at whether it's town meeting day or some of these school um, votes, um, the partici rate, participation rate is abysmal. And um, again, we need to do better. Yeah, the town meeting day demographics have been Turnouts has been declining. What what would that do? You know, if we had stellar turnout for voters, what do you think that would do for school budgets? Do you think they'd be voted up or down? I don't know. I, I really uh, honestly don't know. But that wouldn't be the strategy going in. It's so that people will feel comfortable. For at least they had their voice. They they entered uh, the arena, so to speak, and they cast their vote. So at the end of the day, it's the will of the voters, the majority of voters. Uh, that uh, that prevail. So, the more people who participate, the better off we are as a, as a society. Governor, I have a question about the Act 50 bill. This, as you have noted before, is sort of a hybrid bill that's got the conservation. I think measures. I predicted that. Yeah. Conservation measures you've noted, and also the housing. Uh, exemptions for housing. How are you feeling about that bill now that uh, I think the Senate is moving to remove the, uh, the appellate language so that, it, that that new board won't be the place where appeals will be heard? It's hard to, um, it's hard to follow. I, I know this, uh, it's highly, highly unusual. I don't remember an amendment coming to the floor on a bill that's been meshed together where there's a 127-page amendment. Um, usually that's all worked out in the committee process, brought to the floor, and then there's minor amendments uh, to, the, to the bill. So I don't know who knows everything that's happened in the bill. So I, I, I can't comment on what's in, what's out, and uh, we'll just have to wait and see at this point. One, one key chunk of that bill, though, is that it's Apparently, going to exempt from Act 250 numerous communities and areas around the downtown core of many communities. Does that at least give you some confidence that they're moving in the right direction to slash the red tape so that housing can get built? Well, again, we um, I've advocated from the beginning that they be separated. We had a great bill, S311, and um, had a more of a, a longer-term uh, projected view of Act 250 with 687, uh, they should have gone separately. And, uh, and I think we need immediate relief now. We need more housing today. And uh, S311 could do that. Uh, but unfortunately, it never got through the Senate. Uh, Lots of 311s in that bill now. Yeah, but it never, it never made it through the Senate as a standalone. It made out of committee back in February, but it never made it out of the Senate. 
And today, you could be having a conference committee on S311 instead of this meshed conservation bill and housing bill that may or may not be palatable. I just don't know at this point. We'll have to just see where, where it ends up. Governor, there's uh, some talk in the House Ways and Means Committee about the potential of uh, uh, three votes on the school budget, and after three votes, the voters are no longer involved, potentially. This is an idea that they're floating. Um, do you think that school budget should be allowed to, uh, school board should be allowed to impose school budgets after three votes? No. No, I think it should be voted on until it passes or fails. You know, I mean, just passes. Uh, like, I, that, that doesn't seem like the right direction from my standpoint. That's the first I've heard of this, but no, I, I would not agree with that. Got a few folks on the phones. We'll start with Tim McQuiston from Ron Business Magazine. All right, we'll go to Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Ed, we see you there, but it looks like you're muted. All right, we'll try Keith, Rutland Herald. Uh, hi, so this could be, I just need a lesson in civics, but I was wondering what, what is the practical difference between an interim secretary and a fully appointed one. Like, are you, or is one unable to do something the other can't? Like, what's the, uh, what's the urgency here? Like, what is the, the defective difference, I wonder? Um, I think from my standpoint, uh, there's no difference other than the, the secretary, uh, the interim, has not been uh, approved uh, by, confirmed by the Senate. It's not the permanent position. Uh, the permanent position would have to be confirmed by the Senate. So, but they have the full, uh, full authority uh, as uh, as secretary at that point. Thank you, Jay. Do I have that right? Uh, and she's not acting; she's scheduled. Yes. So that's she's yeah. filling the vacancy that was created yesterday. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. All right, we'll try Ed one more time. All right, uh, can you hear me now? We can. Excellent. Uh, Governor, I, I, I appreciate the fact that the secretary, the interim secretary, just hit the ground running. Um, but is, is there some type of a plan of action in, in terms of what she is going to do? Is she going to put together some comprehensive plan in time for the next legislative session? Is she going to be setting up study committees and groups to deal with all the education issues? Can you kind of give us an idea of, of, of what, what the expectations are from you? Yeah, she, um, she proposed her 100-day plan yesterday, I think, uh, yesterday, or was it today? Today. Um, and um, she went into the House uh, education committee um, to talk about that, but it uh, it involves all of the above, everything that you you talked about. Ed, we'd be happy to send that to you. Absolutely appreciate it. Thank you. That's all I have. Back to the room. So I guess it was Keith's question. You know, if we just went through this really long process of pointing and everything that's been happening behind the scenes, they shoot her down. You name her. Uh, Interim, I guess, what, if, if that's, what was the point of all of this then? To get her confirmed, to move on. But if there's a, I guess, maybe this is a question for Jay, but like, if she can still do her duty and still fill her role and there's no big difference, I mean, what's... Well, because it's not, it's, it's not long term, it's not forever. Um, so we wanted to, um, you know, my... My preference, obviously, would have been for her to be confirmed yesterday, and then we, um, and then she could continue the work she started, and uh, as the, as, as the secretary of education, not being the interim. So, 
again. Because the Constitution says uh, that I can appoint an interim to fill a vacancy. The Constitution also says that they have the right to decline and their nomination. The nomination, she's not the nomination, she's the interim. I, by the way, I've had the same criticism of them overstepping their constitutional authority as well, stepping into the executive branch. So I think we share something in common. Um, have another interview to do there. Um, we're moving, moving forward with that. Uh, and the other, I just finished the last interview uh, for uh, the mayor of Burlington's seat uh, as well. So we should be hearing about that in the next day or so. Will both of those be appointed before the end of the session? I, I'm in hopes at least uh, the, the Burlington seat will. Kind of somewhat sticking to Burlington. Have you been following it all around day three or four, depending how you look at it, of uh, encampments, pro-Palestine rallies, and you yeah, no very kind of also East Coast nationwide. Any thoughts on that? Um, I've only been following it through some of your reports. Um, it's been peaceful. Um, and so I believe in the First Amendment, right to assemble peacefully. And uh, so far, so good. You're, uh, you're on the board of trustees, if I'm not mistaken, for UVM. What do you make of their their calls for UVM to divest? Well, I'm the ex, uh, an ex-officio, so uh, I have not attended uh, any UVM board meetings. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.